Winning Cures Everything. Now for your hosts, Gary and Chris. Welcome in, welcome in. Clemson LSU National Championship reaction and recap. We are a day behind, but that is sometimes a good thing because all of the news that came out afterwards, we get to be on top of it. So, obviously, we're going to talk about Joe Brady. Uh, no, we don't. We don't. We're not. No, we're not. But, no, we're not. We're, we're not. Talk about not tonight. Event. No, we're not. Not today. <laughs> we got plenty of time to talk about off-season things. Okay. Today, okay. you're not busting my bubble, and we're not talking about anything negative because nothing bad happened. Okay. Okay. I'm, I can understand that. Uh, there's a lot to break this, down. That's right. National Championship this is a big game. So, let's go ahead and start off with this. WinningCuresEverything.com is the website. Go check it out for all of our podcasts, picks, previews, videos, social media platforms. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube. We're on Twitter. On YouTube, if you're watching there, make sure you hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and make sure and leave a comment. Tell us what you think about the game, what happened here. Uh, maybe we missed something. I doubt it. But we've missed stuff before. So if we have, toss it in there. Let us know. If you're listening on the podcast, make sure that you... Uh, hit the subscribe button and leave a nice review. We always appreciate that. Apple Podcast, uh, that's a big part of their algorithm. So that helps us out a ton. The show is brought to you by Tunica, Mississippi, the South's premier sports gambling destination. They have got six incredible sports books, along with all sorts of other cool stuff going on. Good shows coming up, good steakhouses, good everything. Uh, go to tunicatravel.com to get more information on that. Let's go ahead and fire in. LSU 42, Clemson 25. A lot of people thought it would be a little bit more high scoring, but throughout the game, that felt pretty high scoring, right? Yeah. Uh, well, one, one of those defenses just didn't let up. No, you're right. You know that one that everyone said sucked and wasn't yeah. no good and they should have been third? And It was um, – well, here's – so here's the – They gave up 37 points to Ole Miss. You remember that? I know. I, and 38 and, to Vanderbilt. And 38 to Vanderbilt. That means Vanderbilt and Ole Miss are better than Clemson. I know, right? That's what that means. Because <laughs> that's what they all That's what Clemson fans said. Yeah, that's exactly what they said. Uh, Clemson took a 17-7 to lead with 10 minutes and 38 seconds left in the second quarter. So basically, in the first 20 minutes of the game, Clemson had three punts, but they had 256 yards of total offense. LSU had four punts and had 114 yards of total offense, only one touchdown in that spot. And from that point on, LSU outscored them 35-8. to eight. Uh, Burrow was injured to start the second half, which it, you and I and, and our group texted about this because it, there was something obviously wrong. Yeah, he, he comes out, uh, he goes into halftime for, I mean, a few minutes and immediately comes back out and does nothing but ride the bike. I mean, that tells you. That's not normal. It's something Something's wrong. And if for those of you that have not had bruised ribs or a fractured rib or whatever. Whatever he's got. You, you can't extend. You can't. It, it hurts to breathe. It's all of that stuff. And once the, the painkillers fired up and everything went numb and he didn't have to feel it anymore, that discomfort was gone. He could play lights out from that right. point on. So this wasn't like a end-of-the-game injury kind of thing. This was... A lot of pain, but he got through it. Like, I, I could only imagine what his, his abdomen area looks like. Oh, yeah. I, I bet it's black and blue. Yep. Just completely black Probably. and blue. Probably. Um, I mean, that was a lick. That was a shot. Oh, yeah. That was a it, – and it was perfectly legal. Perfectly yep. nope. uh, no it, problem. Just a good nope. shot. And you expect that from Clemson, right? That's also a dime he dropped in a bucket, too. Uh, yeah, you're right about that. <laughs> so. Uh, Clemson came out, and here's here's our first quarter stats. Okay. Uh Total yards, 160 to 90 in, in favor of Clemson. Uh, Clemson ran the ball 11 times for an average of 2.7 yards. LSU four times for an average of 1.5. Uh, it was not good. First first quarter, not a ton of offense going on there. Defenses showed up. Clemson's, they were feeling each other out. Clemson's defense came out, and I tweeted out from Pro Football Focus, all of the different personnel sets yep. that Burrow had gone against throughout the season. And Auburn ran a 3-1-7 against them and and tried to get pressure with 3, but more so it was delayed blitzes. It was exotics. And yes, it was nothing all was sorts of nothing stuff. was normal. And that's what he had the least amount of success against. Now, 
he still had success against Auburn. Yep. But as far as the numbers go, that was the personnel set that he had the least success against all season. And it was only he he only hit like forty percent of his passes right. against that on the season. But he hadn't seen a ton of it. So of course Venables brings that out immediately. And I still think that had they not been at like their own three yard line or own two, that he would have been able to do something with that. First play of the game gets called back because of some weird rule. And I just and I know this happened against LSU. It's happened in the pros this year recently. And and every time it happens, I don't understand the purpose of the rule. The purpose of the rule is we're talking about the offensive lineman too far downfield. In they in college can't. football, they can only get three yards from the line of scrimmage. Yeah, that's it. So what it does? Three and, yards is not really you far. Should, you should know that. Um, three yard three yards is a pretty long way. I mean, it's you know we're talking when you're when you are locked up nine, when you're locked up with somebody, and you are pushing them and you are dominating them, then I don't think three yards is very far at all. And are you just supposed to just give? Well, he he wasn't. Like if you go back and watch, he wasn't locked up at that point. Like he, he well, the one in the NFL that I saw a couple of weeks ago, the guy was literally steamroll. And I know you're supposed to be pass blocking, but he was steamrolling a guy. He yeah. was locked up, and I mean he was he was about seven eight yards. But I mean, what are you supposed to do? Just stop blocking the guy? Well, the the difference is the defense can see when a guy is past that certain line, that invisible line. The defense then automatically would know that that is a run play. Because you cannot throw it when alignment is that far downfield. That's the intent of the rule. Um, Three yards just doesn't seem like much at no, all. But but also, Burrow was back there dodging people oh, for yeah. like eight seconds. Oh no, there's no doubt. No. So at that, no defensive back will ever be able to guard anybody. That guard anybody long. without that holding. Long. Yeah. So at some point in time, you're just going to get a defensive holding call if you get nothing else. Yeah. I, if that call doesn't happen. This game looks a whole lot more like the Georgia game yes. than, than you think it does. Because, oh, yeah, because hey, that's like a 28-yard bomb to start the game, very first play, and then no telling what happens from that point forward. Oh, no, I'm, I'm with you. But it didn't work, and then they got backed up, and they're backed up again, and they're punting. Yeah, and they're punting and, and all that. And, look, from that point on, though, from, from the time that it was 17-7, to 7, LSU scored on, what was it, like, Three straight drives to close the half. Yes. They punted twice, and then they scored like two more times in a row. Yep. And I mean, at that, that point, was it. like at, when it got to twenty-eight to twenty-five, I thought, okay, like this is Clemson's been in this spot before, and I still did, like I needed to see Burrow come back out after the injury mm-hmm. and and do something and. I mean, what are they scoring? Like five plays? Yep. I mean, it was just ridiculous. Like immediate down the field and could read everything that was happening. Uh, on the other side, let's talk Trevor Lawrence for a little bit. Lawrence, last year, in the Alabama Clemson National Championship game, that was a blowout, et cetera. What I came on and said, and what the Clemson fans got irritated at us for, was you and I both agreed that Okay, the scoreboard was a dominating score. The game itself wasn't necessarily dominating. There were a ton of plays that were fluky and whatever, but the, it made the stats look great, right? Trevor Lawrence last year, eight out of t- this is on third down only. I'm not even going to look at the full game stats, but on third down, passing, he was eight of 12 for 240 yards and two touchdowns. Eight passes for 240 yards. This year, just on third down, which they converted, what, one of 11? I think that's one right. One of 11. Um, and not that LSU was a ton better in this. LSU was four out of 14, but you didn't need to be. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, but Clemson, one of 11 on third down. Trevor was two out of 10 passing for 20 yards, and he had a sack that was a 10-yard loss. So on third down, they ran 11 plays and gained a total of 10 yards. That is domination by LSU. And on the other side, Lawrence could not hit his guys this time. Nope. And in, in last year's game, it wasn't so much that he hit his guys. He put it where they could get to it, but it was some of the most miraculous catches you will ever see in your life. 
and they didn't do it this game. No. Nope. And that's that's why you can't rely on that kind of stuff. They didn't have a single player in the open field make a big play. And now when they were yeah. wide open, now they got they got free a couple of times and they shook shook free bad yeah. several times. Not one player made a great contested catch. Yeah. The entire game. As the, soon as LSU was able to figure out how to cover them and lock them up a little tighter, all those passing numbers went way down. Now, I did notice um, there was, you know, obviously people hollering on Twitter and whatnot. Everybody thinks everything's crazy. Um, there were two plays that I noticed that that both ended up going LSU's way. So there was the offensive pass interference on Correct. T. Higgins that would have been a touchdown, but then yep. they take it off the board and it backs them up to first and 25 or whatever. And that was in the second half. Um, in the first half, there was a play that – looked like interference on LSU, like offensive pass interference, that they didn't call. And in both instances, probably could have been called either way. But it was the angle. Yep. Like the, the, the back judge could only see one side of things. That's right. And that is what it is. Yep. Like if you go hand fight down there and whatnot, and you and I talked before we came on here, uh, a lot of this was – the Pac-12 refs came out and, and just let them play. The, early. the early the early part of the game, they let them play. They, they didn't call ticky-tack fouls. Now, then eventually they started getting it because I think in both of those cases where LSU got a call, there were also two. First, those were both makeup. The the offensive pass interference is complete a makeup call, yeah. an absolute complete makeup call because the previous drive, an LSU receiver – about to catch a ball and gets tackled by two Clemson guys before the ball even hits to like it's close to him. Yeah. They call nothing. Very next drive, I think an official said, That wasn't my call to make, but I saw that and I wasn't gonna step on another official's toes. Yep. But but I'm damn sure gonna get one back on this side. And and he had an opportunity to do it. That happens in these games. Um and, and there were there was a couple of Really ticky tack penalty. One of the score, the first scoring drive that they had, um, was held on by an LSU pass interference, and they replay. And it, it was about as soft and as ticky tack as you could possibly. <laughs> it looked like LSU had the guy's arm bent back, but when you watch it, I, I took the guy next to me, and he didn't know I was going to do it. Okay, so he he's not tensing up; he's just sitting there. And I walked by him, and I grabbed his arm to see could I pull it back like that. He's just sitting there relaxed, and, and he just can't do it. Yeah, that dude threw his arm backwards. He threw his arm back. It, that you know, and so they called the foul. This thing was called pretty tight. It was called pretty tight both ways. Nobody got screwed in any way, shape, form, or fashion. It didn't affect the outcome of the game yeah. at all. It no, did. You're you're 100 right. Uh, first half total yards. Clemson had 286. LSU had 359 in the first half. That's after having only 90 in that first quarter. Uh, second half, just more of the same. Um, I mean, it was just 269 for LSU, 108 for Clemson. Uh, Clemson ends up with 394. LSU, 628 yards of total offense in this game. Uh, Clyde Edwards-Hilaire has 110 yards rushing, and he was a battering ram uh, in that fourth quarter. What's amazing um, is, 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 yes, in the fourth quarter when they had to kill the clock, and Clemson knows we're running the football. Yeah. And we're running the football with the smallest guy on the field. And they couldn't stop him. Yeah. I just found that to be shocking. That that vaunted defense could not stop this man. How long was that last drive? Do you remember that the one that ran the clock out? Um, hang on, I'd have to pull I gotta I, go to a different I'll thing. let you uh I'll let you pull I'll it up. But it, it up. was it, I mean, it it was just insane. Just insane. Um they had Let's see if it's got total plays on here. Uh, they had 32, no, 32 rushes for the game, LSU did. 13 runs in the fourth quarter and nine passes. So 22 plays to only eight for Clemson in the fourth quarter. Uh, time of possession. Here's, uh, here's the main thing I was looking for. In the fourth quarter, LSU had the ball for 12 minutes and nine seconds. Clemson had it for 251. Yeah, I only got the scoring plays on here. The um, so you got yeah. the biggest problem that I had with Clemson's uh, because obviously, like they had to have known, okay, we're not going to stop these guys, 
So we got to go to our best plays on offense. And their best plays early in that third quarter on their scoring drive was running Travis at the end. Yep. Now, their bread and butter is not between the tackles running. It is, you know, delays. It's getting him in space and all that kind of stuff. And they were able to do that. They gave him the football one time from, like, the 10-minute mark of the third quarter all the way through. Now, obviously, they tried to pass it to him a couple of times, or whatever, but it wasn't a lot. But they handed off one time, and they were only down – by three. Yeah, I was about to say it's not like they were, they weren't three scores at that point. No, like it was it it was mind boggling, like it 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 looked like it, so Alabama. Every year that they have problems with one side of the ball or the other, and they've got somebody that is leaving, and and I bring up Alabama because they always have coaches leaving, and they've been in this game for four years in a row, right? But every year it is oh, well, he's leaving for another job. He wasn't focused on his job. That was the first thing I thought of was, okay, Jeff Scott's already got the USF job. <laughs> See, but but I don't think that that's the thing because it's not, like, I, I thought that's what everybody would, would jump to. Like, not that that's what I thought the problem was. I thought that's what, I, and nobody has mentioned a word about it. Well, I don't think they did because it looked like they threw the kitchen sink at him. The problem is, is they threw the kitchen sink in the first half. Yeah. In the first half on both sides of the ball, offensively and defensively, they ran every exotic blitz you could possibly run. They showed every defensive front and formation they could to try to confuse and to rattle um, Burrow, Brady, Imziger, and this LSU offense. And it slowed them down for three drives. Yeah. And then after three drives, it was over. Defensively, on the on LSU's defensive side of the ball, Clemson's offensive side of the ball. They ran every trick play they had in the book. Yeah. And they better be glad they did, too, because that's one of the only ways they scored. They had Aranda, two good drives. Aranda called a beautiful yes. football game. They had two good drives. Yeah. And after those two good drives, they had nothing else other than a weird reser- reverse, um, and they had two rushing plays, basically, that, that went for, you know, 80-something yards. Yeah. 70-something yards. Yeah, this was – as far as watching the game goes, this game was just as dominant for LSU as it was for Clemson last year. Yep. Um, and it it was kind of boring once it got to be like thirty five to twenty five. Yep. It, it just that you knew that there was no chance. You felt you felt like Clemson had no no shot to come back. Yeah. I mean, there was nothing that they could do. No. It was unbelievable. Um, and throughout this whole game, you know. It, Seven penalties for Clemson for 65 yards. LSU had 11 for 118. Yeah. Um, this, I mean. LSU played kind of a sloppy game. Yeah. Like, it, it felt like LSU ran a ton more plays. Yep. And they ran 16 more, but it was 81 to 65. It wasn't, you know, this wasn't the Ravens against the Titans. No. Like, 92 to 58. Like, this was fairly even for the most part. Like, and LSU kind of runs a little more. Uh, high tempo, up tempo, than Clemson does. So that discrepancy would make sense. But man, uh, before- LSU just scores on big plays so often, or they have big chunk plays. I mean, when Burrow throws such a great deep ball, that I mean, it's, I, it's he is, when when let's, it, let's talk about him. Okay, he is. This is statistically the worst game of the year. Yeah, it is. Because um, he averages about seven incompletions a game. Yeah, and he had eighteen in this. He had eighteen. He that, like it wasn't a even lot close. Was, the worst. A lot of that was early. Oh yeah. And then it was the beginning of the second half oh, yeah. when he was fighting that injury. Oh yeah. But worst far, game of the year: four hundred sixty-three yards, five, five touchdowns, touchdowns. <laughs> and a rushing tutter. Yeah, you you called this. Uh, I mean, just nobody could stop him. Almost perfectly. Nobody like, could was, stop him. And. I, like, I saw that all year, right? And when he did it against Georgia, it was, oh. Like, it's not surprising to me that they did it against Oklahoma. No. It wasn't really surprising to me that they did it against Alabama. Um, Your defense was different. But we did it against Florida. We did it against Auburn. We did it against Georgia. And those are three defenses that I don't think are – they don't take a step back from Clemson's defense at all. You put them in the ACC with a competent offense – and they got the number one statistical defense as well because yeah. it's easy to beat up on high school kids. Yeah, it really is. 
Um, That's I mean, just you, a fact. You put anybody against Clemson's schedule, Georgia, Ohio State, All those Alabama. numbers become inflated. This yeah. is why I don't like all analytics because all yeah. analytics – and I have no earthly idea on how some of the analytics say they played the 14th toughest strength of schedule. Yeah. That just doesn't make sense to me. It, it doesn't to me either. Now – they did play I, a lot of bowl teams, but that that's irrelevant. But, we let a hundred teams go to the bowl games. I know. I'm, I'm, There's only 130 teams in college this, football. This is the first year that I have really questioned. Now, a lot of it's because my analytics bit me. But you realize that some of these numbers lie. It's well, it's because they they are so they're they're more inflated now than I think they ever have been. Like it used to be success rate was a really good indicator of what a team was going to be able to do. Um, I should have seen, like, Clemson gave up 520 yards of offense to Ohio State. I should have paid attention to that. Like, a lot more attention. I thought it was We talked a, about if Ohio State can score touchdowns and not kick field goals, they blow them out. Yeah. That game gets ugly. That game gets ugly early. The – the problem that – so, Venables running the 317 was was genius to yep, start off Nope, with. he did great. But, he threw everything he had at him. Well, but the, the issue that you run into – You got smart guys on the other side of the field. Not even that. Okay. It is – one, so we understand, and we've talked about this all year, that if you bring pressure on Burrow, he oh, actually pick, yeah. gets statistically better. Yep. Um, but if you just let him sit back in the pocket, he is going to pick you apart. So, I'm about to say, there's no good way to play him. There's, there's I mean, not. you need to have um, 13 or 14 guys on the field. That's what you need. But the problem that Clemson had with running a 3-1-7 is that some of your back seven there are some slow, not super talented guys, yep. right? Like, they are smart, and they understand how to play the ball, but that doesn't mean that they can match up against these LSU wide receivers. Yep. Well, no, I'll tell you this. The secondary did a hell of a job against the wide receivers. Yeah, no, I, no. I'm going to tell you it was less than two times I noticed a wide receiver wide open. Agreed. Now, Clemson had guys wide open early when Burrow was, was picking them apart early, and it was those guys were wide-ass open. Are you talking about Lawrence? When Lawrence, Lawrence was yeah, picking them yes. Yeah. When Cl- but LSU, Burrow – Burrow was throwing guys open. All those big deep passes he was dropping, those guys were covered, man. Yeah. They were covered. No, they, they were covered they were bad. All covered. those slant passes, we didn't get the yak yards that we usually get. Because, I, oh yeah, because dude is covered. Well, it's because they understand how to play their role. Yeah, that's Venables all day long. He yeah. gets the credit for that. He gets the glory for that. But the, the problem is, is you can't stop it. When he can throw the football through a keyhole and you have receivers that are just that talented, there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're you're 100% right. If you would have told me before the game started, so I was looking for uh, uh, a prop bet to bet uh, against one another, okay? Yeah. And I basically wanted to bet all of the, all of the passing and rushing stats against uh, Burrow and Trevor Lawrence. Because Trevor Lawrence was so, you know, everyone said, you know, Burrow won the Heisman and he had the year, but Lawrence is the better quarterback. Lawrence is the better player. And I said, okay, well, let's let's find some props here. And I couldn't find any that would let me. They would let me compete with receivers if I wanted to, and I had to pick an individual receiver. But I couldn't do a head-to-head between Burrow and Lawrence for touchdowns, passing yards, rushing yards. Completions, completion percentage. No, there was no statistical category, and and it it allows that bet. I I could go in for Sunday in the playoff games, and I could do that. Yeah, and and I could have done it in other games. It wouldn't let me do it here. You know why? Somebody in Vegas knew five touchdowns to zero touchdowns is a possibility. Yeah, it was, and we can't accept that. Burrow, we can't accept that action. Burrow is, but without a doubt in my mind. Uh, the this is the best year from a player yep. that I have ever seen. Best single year in the 150 years of college he, football. He did not have a bad game. You no. can call the Auburn game a bad game. They still had over 500 yards total offense. It was better than this game. He still had yeah. he still had a ton of a ton of yards. A, a, his completion percentage. He had almost no incompletions. Yeah, I mean it was insane. He threw what six t- t- uh, interceptions the entire season, sixty, 60 touchdowns. touchdowns. Yeah, it it's that it seems that seems good. I I have to one think INT that we, for every ten touchdowns. I I because I am 
currently a prisoner of the moment. I would say that we will never see this again. But the way that offenses are improving. Yeah, I'm not saying we'll never see it again, but I I know that as an LSU fan. But I I have never seen it. I've never seen it. No, we've never seen it. One of the stats I found funny, going into halftime, I saw this tweeted out, and I wish I could remember who tweeted it. I'd give him credit for it. But only two quarterbacks in the history of national championship game football, okay, has ever thrown for 250 yards and rushed for 50. That is Vince Young, Joe Burrow. Joe did it in the first half. Yeah. It's it's it took It took Vince Young that game-sealing, game-winning rushing touchdown to get him to 50. Yeah. And Burrow had it in the first half. Yeah. It's unreal. He's – he really is, and and he's not getting praised like Andrew Luck got praised when he came out um, and, and and talked about how he's you know the best quarterback prospect since Peyton Manning. I don't know if he's going to do much combine stuff. I don't I don't know any of that. I'm going to tell you from watching him play football. I watched every second of all 15 games. Well, and you watched him all last season too. Oh yeah, and, but, and there that's, is that's one of the more surprising things is that last season he was. Okay, he was good. Not he was not great. I mean, what, he was good. What did he have sixteen touchdowns. And yeah, like, sixteen touchdowns, six interceptions. Yeah, I yeah. mean it. It was fifty-seven percent completion percentage. No, he still had a good, and he, he didn't have a percentage point. He didn't have an off season with his offense. He right. showed up last year in May and or in August at LSU. Yeah, in August they start playing football in August. The, the the fourth week of August is when college football kicks off. Yeah. He was there for three weeks. He had no off season with his team. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's remarkable. No, it's, it's unbelievable. It's pretty impressive. Um the the storyline is is just you can't you can't say anything else about it. It was um it was fun to see it. One so when I say that I had never seen a quarterback do this. One, uh, obviously, we've never seen a quarterback do this at LSU. No, like, no, no. There's no, no. anything If you would have thought, if you would have thought, who would the greatest quarterback performance ever come out of? Like, obviously, you would have picked USC. You, yeah, you'd have picked, a, you you'd know. have picked 100 of the 130 schools before you got to LSU. Yeah, because they have never been. Because, I mean, we've them. seen these things happen in, like, Hawaii and stuff like yeah. that. But, no, I mean. It well, was because just it's remarkable. so difficult to be able to do it in the SEC against these defenses. Against these defenses, that's right. The fact that it was done well, against these defenses, I, I'll tell you, and not to cut you off, but no, 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 you're you're good. It, it's it's remarkable that the only two other players that I would put on this list are Cam Newton and Tim Tebow, who also did it in this conference against now, the best. Now Vince Young also had a really really good year. Vince Young had a good uh, year, but. His numbers, numbers wise, the entire season was not no, was no, not no, close to close Cam to Newton at all. Cam Cam is so far above Tim. Tim's is a body of work because he was in college for four years and he and he played a lot as a freshman and was a three year starter. To be fair, like with the Cam Newton thing, Cam did not have nearly the talent around him nope. that Burrow did. Nope. Burrow was able to utilize every ounce. They're, of they're, different they're different quarterbacks. They're different. Oh, very much so. Very much so. But but Cam didn't have the accuracy. Cam's not dropping that ball forty five yards down the field in a bucket. Nope. Nope. I mean, he's just he's just not. He's dangerous in a different kind of way. The other quarterback that uh, that everybody was, uh, not everybody. I think uh, I think Clay Travis's show was talking about it this morning, but single season, uh, Steve McNair's last year at Alcorn State. I got that's that's a whole different thing. Yeah, but he had. I would have never watched one second or heard anything. It was like twelve games. He had like forty seven hundred yards passing and forty four touchdowns and like it. He was he was unreal. There's a reason why it was an Alcorn State quarterback that went like number three in the draft. That's right. You know, so he was unbelievable. But yeah, this we were talking in our group. No, it wasn't. It was it was the guys I watched the game with last night that came over. Um. It, I was trying to find out who the real comparison of him Burrow is, and I and I said I think it's McNair. Well, so first we have to stop with the if it's a black quarterback, I can only compare him to black quarterbacks. If it's yeah, a white quarterback, no, this I, is I really because it's not Tom Brady because Tom has never been this athletic and coming out of college, Tom didn't have these accolades. Tom went in the seventh round. He ain't going number one overall. And all of the guys that's gone number one overall, they don't look like Burrow. They don't play like Burrow. They don't. 
I thought last I said this last night to the guys I was I I think it's McNair. Yeah. I really do. Yeah, I, I could Because see that. McNair was I don't know how accurate McNair was, but he was accurate enough. He made big plays and he could do it with his legs or his arm. And yeah. uh and he was a smart quarterback who I felt like figured the game out kind of quickly. Um and uh I and mean, that's, you give him a little bit, dude. and he's going to be able to dissect right. whatever defense you throw at him. And so I, I, you know, the game was obviously so different when he was playing at Tennessee. Yeah, just a just a completely different. I mean, it's, football game back then it was more geared towards defenses. That's right. So, but he's the guy that if you told me give me an honest comparison, I I think that's it. I think that makes sense. Um, to go on and wrap this up, uh, we'll we'll end up with with discussing what a disservice the sport of college football does to their fans. Okay. Um, the, the numbers this year were better than last year. Uh, you had 25.588 million viewers on ESPN last night. Last year was 25.28 million. So it was better by like 300,000. Um, but good gracious. One, they do their media day on Saturday. Two days before the game. So the game is on Monday. So you have NFL playoff games on Saturday and Sunday. So all of the news, all of the good stories that would come out of media day that could go out through the press, through the media, are completely washed up. Nobody cares. Nope. Everybody is watching NFL stuff on Saturday and Sunday. So any story that came out over the weekend, nobody's going to know. Like, that is the first thing. The second thing, and I understand that this is TV. Right, obviously, this sport has gotten bigger because of TV uh, money and all of that. But the the idea of a championship game, and it's the same thing with the Final Four, right? And they do it on Monday night because it's Monday night football, and Monday is a good TV night, and et cetera, et cetera. But you had a game that kicked off at seven eighteen Central Time last night. That is eight eighteen Eastern, which is where. The majority of the population is located, is on East Coast time. But this is a school night. This is a work night. I stayed up. I'm used to staying up until midnight. My wife ain't. You know, my kids ain't. Uh, to, to put your marquee matchup, two undefeated teams and all that, to where the game ends at, what was it, 1130? It was earlier Central. than that. It was earlier well, than that. Like 11.15, I think, was the last snap. Was it? Yeah. I don't remember it being that late. I think but the, I don't remember the actual lot. time was kickoff at 7.18, and the last snap was at 11.14 p.m. That sounds about right. 11.14. So, after midnight on the East Coast. I, I don't have such a beef with that. None of that stuff bothers me. I don't know when to do media day. I don't know. I don't know the best way at, around it. At least it. do media day on Friday so but, that it can get in the news cycle. Right? But yeah, if you're going to do it, it's fine. Because um, you're competing with the playoffs no matter what. They should have bumped it up a week. Yeah, they so, should have bumped it up to. It should have been last Monday. Well, the reason that it wasn't last Monday is so there were all these stories about well the Saints had a game and they couldn't like for whatever reason do this and that. It wasn't that. It was that but if it was, it was previously was, scheduled, hang on. If it was previously scheduled a year in advance, which this stuff is, then the Saints know we can't have a home game this day. Oh, but it's a playoff game. I mean, they, <laughs> oh shit, you're yeah. right. You can't predict so, that. But you that's figure here's, something out. But here's, here's oh, they would have had they would have had the Sunday game or a Saturday game. Well, here they could have played the Saturday game because of that. Probably that would have been a real easy fit because there's a game on Saturday still, and Sunday. The reason why the game was this Monday instead of last Monday is because. Initially, um, every playoff semifinal was going to be on either January 1st or December 31st. And then they realized, holy crap, doing these games on December 31st is really bad for ratings. Yep. So they they move stuff back. January 1st, we're having a different conversation. New Year's Day is when the semifinals should be held. Yeah, and we we talked about this before. Yes, um, but they're but, but it, they're but they're married to the Rose Bowl, which and is, the Rose Bowl is the single bowl that controls everything else scheduling wise. Yeah, because they have to kick off at five o'clock, so that right at right at the fourth quarter, you have the sunset over the mountains, and it's it's what they want. Yeah. So therefore, you can't have a night game behind them because it's too late. Yeah. You, you can if it's a shitty bowl game that nobody cares about, Agreed. but you can't have like the other semifinal game. 
but you also don't want the first semifinal game to be at noon. So all you need is to, to tell the Rose Bowl, we make a billion dollars a year, and you're and, a parade. And we're paying you. Yes. You're going to money. be a 3 o'clock game or a nine o'clock, or 8 o'clock game. Or you can be a December 31st game. No, you can still. You don't. Do. Nope. I wouldn't even give him an option. You don't get an option if you want a. If you want to be one of these bowl games that are going to host a playoff, or you can get rotated out completely, and we will find another bowl game yeah. that will take over the spot. What the Las Vegas is about to have a big ass stadium. Yeah. You know what? We will take the Rose Bowl, and now you can put your game whenever the hell you want it. And we'll have but, a semifinal but at the Rose We're the still going to do Vegas. the semifinal at this time. So if you want yours on New Year's Day at sunset, guess what? You're going to be competing with a semifinal game. Yeah. So I really hope Washington and uh, uh, Penn State is, is a better draw than whatever playoff game you get. Yeah. Congratulations on that. That's – I'm with you. I'm with you. I agree. Like, I, I – Just push them around. For the longest time, they push these kids around like crazy. Oh, yeah. but they won't push the the organizations around at all. They're no. weak as well water. It's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, the reason that I have such a problem with this is because you should be doing things to advance the sport. I agree. Um, that that should be the goal, no matter what. And I feel like it is the goal. What night would you have the championship game on? Because like, you, do you it can't. On, you compete. do it on Saturday. You know, you can't compete with the NFL playoffs. But, I mean, what do you... You just can't compete with the NFL playoffs. You won't get a number. I assure you, you won't get a number. So, do you not... And all of the these NFL? stadiums host the NFL playoffs also, or an NFL team. So, you're going to end up with one of these situations where one of these teams might be in that game. You don't compete with the NFL. I mean, Having you, it you, on Monday night is not a problem. People stay. Look, people are going to stay up late for the Super Bowl. They're going to be out till midnight. It's going to be fine. They're going to go to work the next day, or they're going to take off. Okay, yeah. okay. you're going to make a business decision as an adult. That is just part of it. People who live on the West Coast, th- we've been having late stuff for a decade. All right. Yeah. TV no, has dominated things to. forever. So, so that I have no problem with that. My my problem is. The, the scheduling of all this stuff, we let a few bowls dictate everything. Yeah. And those few bowls monkey it all up. That's what drags this shit out to January 14th. Yeah. That's yeah, the I problem. Agree. This thing should have ended two weeks ago. Yeah. I mean, you're really right. And all those crappy bowls that happen after the semifinal, no, no. It's either got to be great games after that or no games after that. No, I'm, I'm because everybody is done with crappy football. Crappy well, football has to be over by crap, time your 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 play by time New Year's Eve gets here. Crappy football still brings numbers, which is why that's ESPN fine. Did. I don't mind that, and so, all those people can watch all those shitty games December 25th, December 28th, December 30th. Right, but if we're if we're talking December about, 16th, if we're talking about business decisions and whatnot, that's part of it. And ESPN the good games can be later. The good games can be later. There's a bunch of good games that happened December 19th. Yeah, yeah. Or whatever yeah. that Saturday was. It, it was It was really weird this year having only four games on January 1st. Yeah. And none of them mattered. None of them mattered at all. Yeah. January 1 should be, if you want to fix this, January 1 should be the semifinal games. You yeah. can have your two power six or, or whatever it is, New Year's Day you know, bowl games that are not in the circle of friends. Basically, you're going to have the same four BCS bowls on New Year's Day. Yeah. All four of the, those are the only bowls on New Year's Day. And the four BCS bowls, two of them are going to be playoff games. Yeah. Th- this is not that hard. But the somebody has to stand up and be a grown-up in the room and go tell the Rose Bowl to go screw themselves. Yeah, I'm with you. You're going to take my check. You're not going to not take my check. Yeah. So, so I'm we're going, going to do it. At, we're going to do it at this time. And we don't give a shit about your sunset. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Um, what was the numbers? Uh, 25.588 million viewers. We just talked about this. Uh, to 25.28 for last year. So this year, 300,000 viewers better than last year. Virtually uh, the same. And virtually the same. And they were both, you know, by middle of the third quarter, basically over. Yep. So, um, yeah, this it was, it was interesting. Ed Orgeron? Fantastic. It's such a such a fantastic story. You know? I mean, you can't write this shit. No. 
This I mean, is, you really like it, if Disney you, tried to write one of those old school cheesy Disney sports movies. This, this, this would have been, filled, and this like, was it. Somebody would have been like, "That's this is not way real. too cheesy. It's That's not, not real. real. Get it out of here." I mean, you you had to have the perfect, uh, just every di- destiny in yeah. sync. This is sun like, and moons all aligning. The Saints sent Joe Brady to Baton Rouge for a camp to kind of help them out with RPOs and, and whatever else. And had they not sent Joe Brady... Well, they did that. They did that to get him some money because he was a part-time employee yeah. that made like $26,000. People think all these NFL coaches and analysts and all this stuff make a lot of no, money. They, they when you're money. the entry-level guy, you don't make dick, boys. Yeah. So they it, Try they, to go get one of those jobs. They're they going to ask you to work for free. And then they they're going to send you to do this shit so you can make some money. But But had they not sent him... And it was just some other random yep. guy that didn't could have been it anybody. Could have been anybody else. Exactly. Um, but if it was anybody else, I doubt that they have the season that they have this year. Probably. Joe, but Joe Burrow. That's what I'm saying. Like it, it's destiny. It's the way it all happened. Had had Mike Riley at Nebraska wanted Joe Brady, uh, not Joe, Joe, Burrow. Joe Burrow, then you don't have Burrow any of this. Like fail at Ohio any, State. Any of this. It had had Burrow not gotten injured a little yeah. bit at Ohio State, and he won the job over Haskins, you don't have this. Had Orgeron gotten the job at USC, had Oliva not taken a chance on him, which, I don't get me wrong, we still don't like Joe Oliva. That's fine. But no, I, had, I, I feel differently now after I've read, read that article you sent me. That's, or Sam ah, sent me. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, because you, you were, before that, it was, screw that guy. Well, and it's, then it was, it's different, though, man. I mean, there's always going to be yeah. a pain there. I I grew up in a world in which Les Miles was the most important coach of my life. Yeah. I grew up with a person without a father, without a male figure in my life, and I had coaches of teams that I loved. I know that's pathetic. I know that's sad. But I, don't think it's I, I think there's I, more I, people I, like I, you than you would think. I grew up I grew up with the it was basically it was basically Les, Bill, and and Terry Francona. Yeah. Were, were the three men in my life that I learned how to be a man from. Uh, you do know, you, do you just know shit how like many, that. How many kids in Alabama were the same way with Bear Bryant? Yeah. It's the same thing back then. Yeah. Like it's And so and he he's the guy that fired my coach. Yeah. Now yeah. am I glad that all this happened? And and we even talked about it. Like it he had to go. He yeah. just refused to make any changes, I think, because he was too close to situation. That's why you don't do business with friends, people. You'll be very careful about that shit. So anyway, and so after that, he was dead to me. Yeah. There's nothing. I mean, I I physically would have pushed him out a window and went to bed the next night and just slept like a baby. Yeah, like it was different. But I understand that now. Yeah, I mean, I'm a little bit past it. it a little bit, is, not football, all the way past it. Football is a business, and and so is basketball, which is what cost him his job. So that's right. Um. But but yeah, the Orgeron stuff, the the Joe Brady stuff, the Insminger stuff, the fact that Orgeron was was willing to drop Canada immediately, like it, where where Les Miles was too close to the situation, didn't want to fire his buddies. Yeah, Miles had uh, not Miles uh, Orgeron. Orgeron has been willing to change whatever needs to be changed. I mean, in his first three years, it's, the coaching it's, turnover it is, is... It is crap or get off the pot. You're going to perform or you're going to be gone. Everybody yeah. is held to this obscenely high standard. Yeah, and it's what but he was willing to, to But he was willing to pay him, though. Oh, yeah. And that's the one thing I appreciate. He took way less money than anybody else was going to take. But he made damn sure, no, 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 you're not just saving all this money that I'm not taking. You're giving it to these guys. Yeah. You're giving it to them. And it, it has worked out. He paid Canada beautifully. Well, but he held Canada to the high high standard that he was getting paid for. When you didn't meet that, hit the bricks, my friend. Yeah, you got that right. Now, Ensminger, everybody talks crap about, and I understand Ensminger way back when, but it, when, well, football is so different from way back when when he used to be an OC. Yeah, and and don't get me wrong, God. he was not a good OC back then. But, yeah, the but, game was so oh, it was different. completely different. And I'm with you, but what what I'm saying is, he not only adapted and evolved, but like when he was thrown in as the OC in 2016, Orgeron set records. Yeah, like that team set offensive records, and it yes. wasn't passing records. No, they but were it running was still for 450 yards. A That's game. right. We look, yeah, we look like Wisconsin. It was bananas. That made me smile. They they took the personnel that they had. 
And Insminger found ways to get them the football. And it was insane. Now, it didn't work against Alabama, and that was everybody's problem yeah. for the last few years. But, like, nobody worked against Alabama no. for a long time. But Orgeron and that bunch found a way to to mesh. And and I don't think that this is just a flash in the pan kind of this isn't a Gene Chiswick kind of thing. Like could no they, way. could they win eight or nine games next year only? Yep. Absolutely. Yep. That does that's not what Auburn did. Auburn we're, went from from We're losing the single greatest player. Exactly. Not just in LSU history, but in all of college football history. If that's not worth two or three games, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. I don't know. The, the, but I, but then I he wasn't think, then he wasn't that great to begin with. I don't think, and I'll fight somebody on that. I don't think that now on on the Alabama side, the reason Alabama is able to maintain, like I wouldn't be surprised if next year Alabama loses three ball games. Yeah. Because you lose Tua. Who was the best quarterback in Alabama history. And it is also the reason why Alabama never had a quarterback like that before because they built teams that did not yeah, rely that's right. on, on one, one man. guy. That's right. And LSU has never had a team that relied on, on one, one guy. guy. So I am curious what it's going to be that's like. That's why we were always able to be what we used to be. But if you want to win, you can't be that anymore. Exactly. You can be Georgia, which congratulations, if he wasn't in the East, he'd have three losses every damn year. Yeah. It, don't that's worry, the like, problem. Georgia still went 12-2. and two. We all talk like Georgia had this awful year. But when the when the they went twelve and level, two because they're in the East though, Gary. I, I understand. If that. they if Auburn and them flip spots, they got a worse record than Auburn because they don't beat Bama. Now nah, probably not. Probably not. They would have had them early. They don't. You know? They just don't. No, I think you might be right. You might be right. Um, but yeah, this was. They I look good because they're in the East. I don't think that this was a flash in the pan for LSU. I think that this is something that can continue to build Orgeron in that bunch going forward. Now, it doesn't mean it, that they're going to go 11-1 no, and one every my, year. My, my, the thing that I'm most proud of with, with O, and it's, it's the staff that he's built, but the most important key to any successful business, all right, I know this from business. There's only one attribute that everybody in the building has to have. If everybody is good at the same thing, you're going to fail. Yeah. All right? But everybody can be – good at different things and you still fail the single most important attribute that everybody who walks in the door has to have for you to be or at least 90 percent of the people is flexibility you yeah. have to be able to adapt yeah you have to be able to change when things change and i'm going to tell you brady made it abundantly clear when he when he won the assistant coach of the year award that this is steve emzinger's award people think i don't brady doesn't call plays he might have designed those offensive well, schemes. He, he play. Like he, he calls. He, he calls, calls some, some third, third downs. downs some some third downs. Now, how many third downs did we have this year? Because I don't think it was, it was a lot. Not, it was not a ton. And if you base it off of this game, he was four out of fourteen. Yeah. So. But but we don't. We just don't have a lot of third downs. No. There's been games where I've joked with you when we just beat the hell out of people. Are we going to have more third downs or more incompletions? Yeah. And I bet both of them could be less than five. Just because they score so fast, so often they get get well, plays on first so and second. On, yeah, on early it, 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 and so I think Steve Emsinger is going to be just fine. He's the one I'm afraid of losing. But here's the other thing: at not any point in time did you see him get upset, him get mad that the spotlight wasn't on. He didn't give a damn. He's an old school football guy. He don't want to talk to the media. He don't want to go up there and take that award. He don't want to. He don't want his picture taken. No, he just wants to go to work. That's it. Now you're 100 percent right. That's, I was so, going to try and look up the uh, Alabama LSU game to see how many third downs because I don't think it was very many. Uh, that yeah, that game or incompletions. That's but I can't I can't get it to pull up for me. Sorry, that's not good. Um, but at at this point, it doesn't matter. No. It's no big deal. Uh, is there anything else that we need to hit? No, I, I think we're I think I think we're okay on this. I uh, hang on, I got it here. LSU third downs. Oh shoot, we were eight for fifteen. We had fifteen third downs. Y'all had fifteen third downs. Y'all were six for fifteen. Yeah, fifteen third downs is more than I thought. Even still, uh, eight for fifteen is pretty good. Well, and yeah, eight over fifteen is really like, over eight for fifteen is really good. Um, Bur <laughs> Burrow had seven incompletions in that game. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So. 
to wrap it up, obviously, this is the uh, the last that we will talk about. the. Now, we're still going to do a recap of the bowl games. We're going to do a recap of the season, what we what our thoughts were and what it ended up and all that kind of mess. And we will continue talking in the offseason. But congratulations. Thank you, sir. We have been doing this for four seasons now. Uh, you had to put up with with my team being in the national championship game. Every year. Every year up until this one. And this year, it was your bunch. And I am very happy Thank you. that you finally got this one. I appreciate uh, it. It was, it, this was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun the, seeing you enjoy football the way that you did this season. The, num- the numbers that come through this, you know, where they have, fo- they beat, so they beat the fo- all four preseason top one, two, three, and four yeah. teams. They beat five out of the top eight schools, and then Auburn and Texas were, were, were throw-ins. Auburn's a top, I don't know, 15 school, probably top 12 school. Yeah. And then you Texas, had Texas A and M, and then and then Texas A and M and Texas. Um, this is the Which this is the, was, uh, was preseason number eleven. Yes, so this is the greatest single resume of all time. People can argue is this the greatest team, and I do believe that this because of what they went through, the gauntlet that they ran, and how they beat people. I'm gonna say this again. I said it before the game in the preview. I'm gonna get back on this one more time. This game included. At no point in time did they ever trail in the fourth quarter or the other team have the ball with a chance to score and take the lead. They were always at least two or three scores above everyone Yeah, the entire season. Clemson, no different. They never had the ball in the fourth quarter with a chance to score and even bring it within two scores. It was well, they had, a chance, they had a chance to bring it within two scores, but they, they didn't have a shot to bring it within one. So, Because by the time you got to the fourth quarter, it was 35-25. That's right. They did yeah. have a 10-point game. So it was a 10-point game, but then... I thought it was 17 soon, almost. As soon as Clemson gave them the ball back, it was, they went that's right when, down and That's scored. when they got to 17. So they got to yeah. 17 pretty quick. That's right. And so, that's right. yeah, it was, it was dominant. It was dominant. That's the most dominating performance I've ever seen from a team from start to finish. Yeah. It's uh, it was it was fun to get to witness it with you. I appreciate it. It was a fun ride. This is the greatest single. This is the most fun championship I've ever had. I could uh, I could and I've and I've I've liked good teams. So you know, I've rode some Red Sox seasons that were unbelievable, and and David Ortiz is probably probably the most important athlete in my life. Um, and then all the years with Tom and the Patriots, you know, I got to see one great Celtics team. Yeah, yeah, but this one, this one's the most fun of all. This one, this one meant uh, I think it I was more. at the Sugar Bowl where they beat Oklahoma. Uh, Oklahoma, and that wasn't as fun as this. No, I can believe it. So. I can believe it. All right, that is going to wrap it up. Of course, go over to winningcureseverything dot com. You guys know what's going on over there. We've still got the picks contest going for the duration of the NFL playoffs. Uh, we'll start adding in some college basketball games or whatever because uh, we've still got three weeks um, with. AFC, NFC title games, and then the week after that will be the Pro Bowl and, you know, some college basketball stuff. That's, college basketball is picking up uh, very quickly. And uh, and we've still got rooms to give out at Tunica and all that kind of stuff. So go over to winningcureseverything.com and check it out there. Hit the subscribe button on YouTube. Hit the subscribe button on the podcast. Make sure and leave some comments. Leave a review. And make sure you check out tunicatravel.com. Tunica, Mississippi brings you the show. They are the South's premier sports gambling destination. We appreciate all of y'all for watching for the 2019 season. Like we said, don't go anywhere because we will continue throughout the offseason. But you guys have been magnificent. We will see you all again, uh, really, later on this week. (laughs) Thanks for checking out Winning Cures Everything. If you want to keep up with us, hit subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Visit the website at winningcureseverything.com or you can like us on Facebook or follow us at Winning Cures, at Gary WCE, or at Chris B. Giannini on Twitter. Share out the show, leave a nice review, and make sure to comment and tweet at us.